Minute by minute went by. It seemed an age since the fishermen had gone, but presently the sound of voices interrupted the sea's murmur. Cautiously stealing a glance through a chink, imagine my feelings on perceiving half a dozen of our half soldiers coming down the beach straight towards us. Then my heart was bitter within me, and I tasted defeat, even with Haru in my arms. Luckily, even in that moment of agony, I kept still, and another peep showed the men were now wandering about rather aimlessly. Perhaps, after all, they did not know our, of our nearness. Then they took to horseplay, as idle soldiers will, even in Mars, pelting each other with bits of wood and dead fish, and thereon I breathed again. Nearer they came, and nearer, my heart beating fast as they strolled amongst the boats until they were actually larking round the one next to ours. A minute or two of this, and another footstep crunched on the pebbles, a quick, nervous one, which my instinct told me was that of our returning friend. Hello, old sprat catcher, going for a sail, called out one of the soldiers, and I knew that the group were all round our boat. Haru trembling so violently in my breast that I thought she would make a ves the vessel shake. Yes, the man said gruffly. Let's go with him, cried Cried several voices. Here, old dry haddock, will you take us if we help haul your nets for you? No, I won't. Your ugly faces would frighten all the fish out of the sea. And yours, you old chunk of dry mahogany, is meant to attract them, no doubt. Let's tie him to the post and go fishing in his boat ourselves, someone suggested. Meanwhile, two of them began rocking the cobble violently from side to side. This was awful, and every moment I expected the net and the sail which our friend had thrown down unceremoniously on us would roll off. Oh, stop that, the Martian said, who was no doubt quite as well aware of the dangers we were. The tide's full, the shoals are in the bay. Stop your nonsense and help me launch like good fellows. Well, take two of us then. We will sit on this heap of nets as quiet as mice and stand you a drink when we get back. No, not one of you, quoth the plucky fellow. And here's my staff in my hand. And if you don't leave the, my gear alone, I will crack some of your ugly heads. That's a pity, I thought to myself, for that they take to fighting, it will be six to one, long odds against our chances. There was indeed a scuffle and then a yell of pain as though a soldier had been hit across the knuckles. But in a minute, the, the best disposed called out, Oh, cease your fun, boys, and let the fellow get off if he wants to. You know the fleet will be down directly, and Arhap has promised something worth having to the man who can find that lost bit of crackling of his. It's my opinion she's in town, and I, for one, would rather go look for her there than go haddock fishing any day. Right you are, mates, said our friend with visible relief. And what's more, if you help me launch this boat, then you go then go to my mistress, missus and tell her that what you've done. She'll understand and give you the biggest pumpkin full of beer in the pet place. Ah, she will understand and bless your soft hearts and heads while you drink it. She's a cute one, is my mistress. Aren't you afraid to leave her with us? Not I, my daisy, unless it were that sight of your pretty face might give her hysterics. Now lend a hand. Your accursed chatter has already cost me half an hour of the best fishing time. In with you, old bucket, shouted the soldiers, and I felt the fisher fisherman step in, and as a matter of fact, he stepped in on my toes. A dozen hands were on the gunwales. Six soldiers' yells resounded. It seemed in my very ears there was the grit and rush of the pebbles under the keel, a sudden lurch up of the bow bows, which brought the fairy lady's honey-scented lips to mine, and then the gentle lapping of the deep blue waters underneath us. There's little more to be said of that voyage. We pulled until out of sight of town, then hoisted the sail, and with a fair wind held upon one tack until we made an island where there was a small colony of hither folk. Here our friend turned back. I gave him another gold button for my coat, and the princess a kiss upon either cheek, which he seemed to like even more than the button. It was a small payment, but the best we had. Doubtless he got safely home, and I could but hope that Providence somehow or other paid him and his wife for a good deed bravely done. Those islanders, in turn, lent us another boat, 
and with a guide who had business in the hither capital, and on the evening of the second day, the direct route being very short in comparison, we were under the crumbling marble walls of Seth.